here. Detention for several hours. Oh, 30 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> okay, is good. Uh, so, it's, well, thanks for coming again. You know, I enjoyed just being with you yesterday in our little discussion. And I hope you'll enjoy today's talk, which is, you know, it's going to focus on Dune and the imagining of. Ecology. And uh, we could just move. How can we move? It's this thing of, if we were in a yes. seminar with my student group, I'd know you a little bit better. I, I'd know more of what you'd already read or hadn't read and yeah. things yeah. like that. So it's, it's always difficult to talk to people yeah. that you, you don't know, because you don't know what they know already or what they've read. So forgive me if some of this is a little bit obvious to you, and you know it already. But it's for the benefit of those who are coming really fresh into into the thing. So, you know, Dune is a it's not really just a novel by Frank Herbert. It's really the novel by Frank Herbert. Uh, he'd written a prior one, uh, which was quite good. He wrote subsequent ones, mainly about Dune. But Dune really was his his thing, and he had quite a, a restless life, I think. He was a, a photographer uh, for the army in the Second World War uh, for about six months, came back, studied a bit of creative writing, studied a bit of general semantics, couldn't finish his university degree because he was too determined to only be interested in, in what interested him. And he spent quite a bit of time growing up in California. And for me, he has a very Californian spirit or state of mind, particularly the spirit of the 60s and, and the 70s. A number of the jobs he wrote was things he did were for journalism. So he, you know, he, he wrote things for journalism. And Dune actually began with a, a piece he was commissioned to write about some huge sand dunes in Oregon, which were growing and growing and destroying other land. And he went in to look at that project and to investigate it as there was an initiative to control and, and limit or stop the spread of the dunes through introducing various forms of very tough grass, known as poverty grass, to try and arrest the dunes. And he found this, with his re restless, inquisitive mind, he found this really, really fascinating. And that led him to begin reading uh, a lot about ecology and these natural processes. And because his first publications had been some short stories in science fiction magazines, and what he really liked was science fiction, he decided that he must use this material for a science fiction story, which uh, he began uh, publishing it in a couple of parts in a sci famous science fiction magazine called Analog. <coughs> and after that, he, he wanted to revise it and put it together as a whole book. But because of his interest in the subjects, this had now grown 
to something which was still quite unusual in science fiction circles at that time, to a, a novel which wasn't just like 120 pages or so, or as with Asimov's Foundation trilogy, spread out over three volumes or something, but a, a single opus of 500 or 600 pages. And obviously this was a, a big risk for a publisher to publish such a large volume. But even more of a risk was the fact that it didn't really fit with the usual kind of science fiction novel. So 23 publishers rejected it with one of them having a, an inkling that maybe this was actually quite interesting, although it didn't quite fit the idea they had of what the market, what the readers would want from a science fiction novel. And one publisher's reader saying, mm, it's just possible we may be making the mistake of the decade. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, sometimes how gut feelings can be true. Yeah. Well, that guy was right. You know, I think it's the book has sold something like five million or twelve million copies since then. So it was a bit of an error. And as I mentioned yesterday, the uh, the only publisher he could find, and I actually don't know how he arrived at this, was Chilton Books which are still going strong online as the publishers of car repair manuals, <laughs> illustrated car repair manuals. And I don't know how he arranged it, you know, but maybe it was a friend or whatever, but they agreed to publish quite a small run of the book. I think only like 500 copies or 1,000 copies. and. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of this, but this, not a very good reproduction, but this would be, you know, about this size. You know, it was a large format like you'd have for a car repair manual, so the, the drawings and the photos, you could see what was going on and you could repair your car. That was the original, uh, the original, way it got into publication. And it was a slow burn. It wasn't like an immediate hit by any means. But gradually, it accumulated readers. And this is often um, the sign of, of, of what we call in literary studies a canonical text as I mentioned yesterday, but I'll repeat again today. Canonical texts, they're often not popular when, the, when they're first published because there's something new and challenging about them. Perhaps the most famous example is Wordsworth and Coleridge's lyrical ballads, which were greeted with tremendous disdain on their first publication and they're now regarded you know, as a major, major work. Similarly, I say Dune had a lot of trouble uh, getting published, but something about it continues to interest readers, to attract readers, to attract translations, not only into languages other than English, but into video games, into films and into the science fiction channel's single most successful TV serial. Uh, uh, I don't know how many episodes, but quite a lot of episodes into a version of Dune, which you can watch on YouTube for free if you like. And it's, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's funny to watch, but it's a very faithful adaption of the dialogue and the book and stuff like that. So it's, it's quite interesting to watch. 
So, what makes the book special and what makes it a canonical text is a canonical text has to have something funny about it, something that stimulates curiosity over generations. It has to have some complexity to make an individual reader read it more than once and to make generations of readers still be rather puzzled by it and interested by it. And that's why uh, the Dune continues to be of interest. The first step for that is if you put yourself in the mind of a publisher at the time, you'll see that one reason why they would reject it is, well, it, it, was, it, was, it was sort of science fiction, but it was quite different to a lot of science fiction being written and published at the time, because it, it had rockets in and, and things, but it wasn't really interested in the technological. And notably, it, it threw out any discussion of computers, this sort of new thing that was beginning mm. to interest people. And in terms of the book's own history, it said, well, look, computers had taken over, you know, so they'd been banned. And what you now had was humans who were trained to think very precisely and mathematically and to take the place of computers. So that traditional science fiction interest in technology and computing was present in the book, but in an annulled form. And mentats, these characters called mentats, human calculating machines, took the place of them. And the focus of the book in this very Californian sort of way was, was very much on humans and their relationships to each other. Something which science fiction has not always been really interested in or, or focused on. So that made the book read strangely, because like a lot of the book, as you'll find, it's interested in gesture. It's interested in tone of voice. It's interested in the sort of things that, in a way, Jane Austen is interested in, the minutiae of human exchange and interrelationship. And that's quite an unusual focus for the science fiction of that time, and of the predecessor time. And you can see you know, some of Herbert's genius, because I think that's sort of what it is, this putting together of many different strands of thought and tying them together, so that he deliberately wrote the book so that you'd have to read it more than once. There'd be, there's bits of language in it which you can't understand when you first read it. It's only in and through reading it that you get to see what he's on about. So then maybe you want to reread the book because now you understand what those things are and so on. There's a mixture of languages in a way which is almost Joycean. You know, as you know, you know, in Finnegan's Wake, Joyce creates a melting pot of languages and creates a new weird sort of language. It's a, it's Finnegan's Wake is a strange, strange book in that way. But actually, Herbert, though he's no Joyce, does something very similar in that there are a lot of words in the book which are not English words. And they're taken from Hebrew, they're taken from Arabic, they're taken from Russian. It's a real polyglot sort of book. And some words are simply made up. But like, as you see, see what I mean? It's like if you were a science fiction publisher of the time and you were having readers look at this stuff, I can imagine an aggrieved reader saying, well, I can't understand half the words in this book. How is that going to sell? It's really not going to work. When 
in fact, that difficulty or that invention is precisely what makes it interesting and, and enjoyable. And Herbert, you know, when he's thinking it, when he's looking back on writing the book and put it together, you can see the complexity of how he was thinking about making this narrative when he says, I could begin to see the shape of a global problem. And this is starting off from, from the sand dunes and, and the previous novel, The Dragon Under the Sea, was actually about what would happen if oil began to run out, which at that time it hadn't become visible that that was going to happen. So I could begin to see the shape of a global problem. No part of it separated from any other. Social ecology, political ecology, <coughs> economic ecology. I find fresh nuances in religion, psychoanalytic theories, linguistics, economics, philosophy, theories of history, geology, anthropology, plant research, soil chemistry, and the meta-languages of pheromones. A new field of study arises out of this, like a spirit rising from a witch's cauldron, the psychology of planetary societies. And this is like a grandiose ambition. I mean, it's a really, really ambitious project. And it's not surprising that publishers wanting to sell their what would it be, 2,000, 10,000 copies of a new science fiction novel, would be rather frightened by this grandiose project. But, of course, that grandiosity, that ambition, that strange intellectual montage of very different disciplines and areas of knowledge is exactly what makes the book retain its fascination. And rereading it uh, again, I first read the book when it came out uh, when I was 15 or 16, or whatever I was at the time. It was an astonishing book to read. And even when I reread it now, I get transported back to that sense of absolute kind of astonishment with which I first read the book because it, it wasn't like the other science fiction books I was reading. It, it was really something dramatically new and, and very, very different. So, like you could see, you know, Herbert's ambitions were, were really wide you know, really synthetic, really trying to bring together a lot of things. And I'll just mention some of them. Uh, one of the things he studied but didn't get a degree in and gave up after a while was a field known as general semantics, which is a, a part of linguistics sort of looking at the power of words. And again, a very Californian thing. He worked with a uh, a, a guy at the University of California lived in San Francisco. He actually helped him, uh, he sub-edited some of his work, because as a journalist he was quite a good writer. And he had a bit of a dialogue with uh, this teacher, professional teacher of general semantics. So this definitely comes in to the book for a literary scholar, it's not so alien because so much of the book is about the power of words first used to persuade other people, as in the study of rhetoric, but then also in the ways in which words and linguistic exchanges are deeply related to the social ecology in which people live. And because the book deals with a family transplanted to another planet, there's all sorts of niceties and vocabularies of, about movement which, which come into the book, as, as you'll know if you read it. 
So uh, this comes together in one dominant theme in the book. It's about the voice with a capital V, which is when you learn to use language in such a way that you can really persuade other people. And that's partly by looking at them, listening to them, observing them, cal calculating and calibrating what, you know, what will hold their attention. And this reaches the supreme power in the central character of the book, Paul Atreides, who actually develops the power of a voice enough so that he could kill somebody by saying the right words to them, a power he doesn't use as far as I remember. So it's a book about the power of language, which of course gives it a, a sort of literary sensibility in that way, again unusual for much uh, brutalist science fiction writing, which is more concerned with the delivery of the plot and not, you know, niceties of expression or whatever. So, as I said, there's Hebrew, there's Arabic, there's Caucasian, Russian, Soviet languages. In the book, the guy's interest in history comes through. And as I say, you, know, you must see him as an amateur <coughs> person interested in lots of stuff. So he read Gibbons' The Rise and Fall. So a part of its stuff is borrowings from that, imaginings from that. So that this science fiction novel set in the distant future is, is consciously modeled on a kind of ancient or medieval power structure of an imperial emperor, something that the book calls the Faufrelucus system, in this coining of a word which sounds sort of Germanic, but is sort of made up. And this is almost like a caste system of very strong social differences and divisions, everybody in his own place, a very fixed and uh, unmodern sort of uh, social order. Uh, there's interesting Californian style challenges to, or 60s, 1960s challenges to various orders of politics and gender politics. I mean, the gender politics are not as pure as people would like them today. But for the period, there's a very unusual giving of a voice to women in the text, a giving of power to women in the text through what's called the Bene Gesserit order, which is like a sort of Roman Catholic order, really, but an exclusively feminine Roman Catholicism. So. You know, this is Herbert's genius at work, montaging, collaging, pulling bits of familiar things, putting to, together, giving them a twist, and making something, you know, really striking and original with these things. And then it's not only that there's some Roman Catholicism in there, but there's some Zen Buddhism, some Sufi religious themes, there's some Jungian psychology. It's, you know, it's a melting pot of, of many, many different sorts of ideas. And in terms of uh, the very contemporary concerns, a really interesting thing, uh, and I don't know enough about American literature at that period, but this book has one of the most interesting representations of Islam that I've, that I see from the period, in that the free men, Fremen, I don't know how you like, uh, are a, a con 
unconsciously modeled on desert tribes, on Arabs, and a lot of their customs and their clothing and their religion are modeled on Islam. But it's not done in a disparaging way. The Fremen are the heroes to a large extent of the book. And I think that's quite unusual in American uh, narrative thinking. I mean, it certainly would be now, so I'm not quite sure of that. But I think the attention to another people's culture is really, un and sympathetic attention, is, is really unusual, just as the sympathetic attention to women's abilities to understand social exchange is also a little bit of power through that. It's also almost proto-feminist for that period. So, I mean, I'm just sort of rambling a bit about all these things because I just want to bring to your attention what an unusual book it is and how rich and diverse and fascinating and as I say, what a genius or a moment of genius brought this thing into existence. It, it took her but six years to write it, uh, you know, which is quite a long time in some ways for putting something together. But it's a real, it's an incredible achievement to know that. It's a very unusual object. In a different set of lectures, I talk a lot more about the politics of the book in general. This is really, really interesting because you know the book is written in, in the 60s, memories of the Second World War are still quite strong, Cold War is still quite a strong presence in American life. Um, Herbert is actually related in a slightly distant way to, to McCarthy, mm -hmm. but he didn't share McCarthy's uh, politics exactly, although like most people at that time, he despised and detested communism. Nonetheless, there's a kind of almost socialist thinking in the book with its emphasis on community and so on. So again, politically, it's a very interesting book in which the, this comes into the central character, Paul, who is kind of being forced to be the leader of a charismatic religious political movement, which he doesn't want to be in that position, and a lot of the book is about uh, is trying to resist being put into that position. And Herbert's own sense was the politics of the of the trilogy was to beware of heroes, to beware of charismatic figures, whether they were a Hitler, a Stalin, an Eisenhower, or or whoever. So there's a distrust. Of politics. But it's complex. I it, said so that would take a whole other lecture and set of investigations. But I just mention it as, as one of the dimensions of the book and the fact that it's the existence of these multiple dimensions all working at the same time, which give the book, in my view at least, a real canonical status. It's a real canonical text because it's rich and textured and it's doing multiple things. And it, it is quite joyful, you know, this wide spread of interests is, is, is like unusual, really. Or it's unusual to have them, and then to be able to bring off the disciplined articulation of them into a, a particular narrative. So it, it, it's a, a real achievement. But from all that, what I want to focus on, obviously, for the purposes of the course, is just one dimension of the book, and one that's very central to Herbert's own concerns is, is the ecological. And 
you know, he refers to the book, in fact, uh, as he's thinking of it, as an environmental awareness handbook. That's how he comes to describe it. And in 1965, this is really something new and different. The word ecology has, is barely beginning to register on the general public as a term. And Herbert participates in, in this new awareness. And yesterday I mentioned you know, this kind of what's often identified as a starting point of the ecology movement, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, 1963. And I just realized that actually Herbert began working on Dune prior to the publication of that. So again, it's this, you know, he was really a front runner in this new ecological awareness. And you can see that in the dedication of the book, if you've looked at that on the you know, opening of the book. The book is dedicated to the people whose labors go beyond ideas into the realm of real materials to the dry land ecologists. And this wasn't an opportunistic thing of Herbert to, to get a new audience or whatever. It was a lifelong conviction. He went on after the success of the book to do some teaching in universities on ecology, to take part in projects in different parts of the world, to, to run try and run his own ecological household. And you know, it was a real sincere interest on his part. And how this comes through is that what this means is that the planet which this family, royal family, moved to, the planet Arrakis, also known as Dune, you know, Dune is, Dune is Arrakis, Arrakis is Dune. It's not, just, it's not just a setting or a backdrop of the action. And here we can think of what is someone I mean by, if I say, well, look, one of the translations of Dune, you know, one of the remakings of Dune, many people say, is Star Wars, the first Star Wars film, and it's Desert Planet. You know, but there the desert is just a backdrop. It could be, as it is in the other films, you know, an Antarctica or a jungle, or it doesn't really matter that it's a desert. But in Dune, the fact that it's a desert is the center of the plot. So ecology is absolutely central to the story. Uh, it's a moving force itself. And this soon becomes evident or is expressed by the central figure of the book, Paul, very early on in the book, who I, so I don't know if you've read the book or yeah. So Paul is the son of Duke Leo Atreides and his concubine companion Jessica or Lady Jessica. They, in a complex power play, are forced to leave their home planet under the direction of the emperor, the emperor's command to take control of the planet Dune stroke Arrakis. They have to do that, otherwise they have to flee the system. The Duke knows this is a part of a plot against him by other royal families. It's a bit like the crown, a bit exaggerated. But it's part of a plot, but he doesn't have any choice, and he thinks he can turn it to his advantage. His son, Paul, is 15 years old, and he's the central character. Now, Jessica, his mother, has borne him against the wishes 
of the Roman Catholic Church, or not the Roman Catholic Church, but Bene Gesserit people, because she was instructed to have a girl child, and because of her special mental abilities, she could choose whether to have a boy or a girl. But because her husband, or not husband, her companion wanted a boy for the sake of passing on the dukedom, she had a boy, so she's in trouble. So now her boss in the church comes to meet Paul before they make this move from one planet to another. And she's a bit annoyed with Jessica, but she also kind of loves Jessica. You know. uh, but she has, she talks <coughs> to the boy. I, I won't go into other details. So the boss, like the bishop or whatever, is the reverend mother. And while she's talking to Paul, she asks him, what does it mean to rule? And this is the book's first sidestep around those issues of politics which I was talking about yesterday. And Paul's first answer to that is, well, I said what it is to rule is that one commands, that you, that you give an order. That's what ruling is, you give an order. And she said, I had some unlearning to do. So rather than this, and I'll call it Hobbesian for the sake of making a you know, relation to yesterday, instead of understanding rule as being the power to give commands, this feminine order says no, ruling is something complete. It's not about giving commands. It's a more complex thing. And then she said, a good ruler has to learn his world's language, and that that language is different for every world. And at first, Paul, as he says, he thinks this means, well, all that means is that on arrogates, they speak a different language to what we speak on our home planet, Caledon, or even the galactic language, which is kind of a Latin of the interplanetary world. Uh, Galash, a galactic language. And I thought she meant they didn't <coughs> speak Galash on Arrakis. But she said, no, no, that's not what I mean at all. When I say a good ruler has to learn his world's language, I don't mean the language. What I mean is the language of the rocks and growing things, the language you don't hear with your ears. And that's the first intimation in the book, in the first five pages or so, of this focus on ecology. That to rule means to understand the planetary system. And this is what I mean by ecology being not just a background to the story, it is the story in large measure, as you'll see uh, as we Okay, so they arrive on the planet and it's all new and this, there's got to be a different way of understanding and behaving things. They've got to learn how to do that. And one of the first moments is they're in the palace. Lady Jessica is looking out with the doctor and people are walking past the palm trees which are outside the palace. And she, with her Benny Gesser of training and observation, she sees, well, people are looking at these trees and their expressions when they look at them, they're different. Some look at them with fear, some look at them with longing, but like they have a real emotional response to these trees. Why is that? And the doctor explains. Uh, well, he says, they look at these trees and they think, that's 100 of us. That's what they think, says Dr. Newey, the character in the thing. Jessica 
Paul's mother, turned a puzzled frown on him. But why? Why do they think it's a hundred of us? And you here explains, look, those are date palms. One date palm requires 40 liters of water a day. This will be familiar to you from last year's drought, when we were heading towards being Arrakis. A man requires but eight liters. A palm then equals five men. There are 20 palm trees out there. That's 100 men. And that's the first sign of the impact of ecology, the desert planet, on the social arrangements, on the consciousness of people. So, so that's the second kind of hint about the centrality of the thing. A chapter or two further on, you have the first meeting between the Duke, the new controller of the planet, and the, one of the leaders of the free men, or Fremen, a guy called Stilgar. And this is a moment where it would be easy for there to be a big problem because of different communication rooted in different social realities and politeness. But Freeman stared at the Duke, then slowly pulled aside his, they've been arguing about something. The Duke has been trying to get him on his side. And, and the Duke doesn't know how he's responding to his overture. So the freeman stared at the Duke, then slowly pulled aside his veil, revealing a thin nose and a full-lipped mouth and a glistening black beard. Uh, Arabic sort of features, in other words. Deliberately, he bent over the table and spat on its polished surface. Now, in the medieval sort of world, of the Duke's upbringing. This would be a real insult. As the men, the Duke's men around the table started to surge to their feet, Idaho, one of the Duke's advisors who's been living with the freemen and working with them, voice boomed across the hall, hold, before they attack the guy for being so disrespectful. In the sudden stop, sudden charge still the side said, we thank you Stilgar for the gift of your body's moisture. We accept in the spirit with which it is given. And Idaho spat on the table in front of the Duke. Now your homework is, you know, when you go home tonight and you're sitting down to dinner with your family, I want you to spit on the table and then see what the reaction is, and then explain that because we're still recovering from a drought, this is a sign of great respect for the old people around the table. Aside to the Duke, he said, remember how precious water is here, sire. That was a token of respect. So like in a very, it's not a big thing, but it's in a very simple textual detail. You have the expression of Herbert's interest in how ecology has real effects on the social order and socialization. And this is, like as I said, it's a huge uh, theme in the book. It's a part of the book. It's not just a, it's not the background, it's the foreground of the book. And here you can see a lot of the book is about adaption because ecology is understanding adaption of life forms to habitat and so on. And the freemen have adapted this thing called a still suit, which is very like a suit astronauts wear, in that it converts or contains and converts waste, human waste and so on. So wearing this still suit asks Paul to uh, still guard, or no, to Leto, another guy, and this wearing this will stop your water loss from being more than a thimbleful a day. 
properly suited explains the two guys are right now. Properly suited, your forehead cap tight, all seals in order, your major water loss is through the palms of your hands. You can wear suit gloves, but most freemen in the open desert rub their hands with juice from the leaves of a creosote bush. It inhibits perspiration. Now again, you'll see again in that very simple detail that, that rather than wear the artificial gloves, they'll use the natural plant. You know, and it's about this closeness, trying to live with nature <coughs> rather than against it with the Freeman uh, embody. This latitude's life zone has mostly what we call minor water stealers, adapted to raiding each other for moisture, gobbling up the trace dew. Some parts of the desert teem with life. My climate demands a special attitude towards water. You are aware of water at all times. You waste nothing that contains moisture. So this is persistently there through the book, this emphasis on the climate, the ecology, the question of adaption, and so on. Now, Kynes is a planetary uh, planetologist sent by the emperor to survey you to try and understand it. He's joined the Freeman, really. He's become a Freeman through working on ecology. He's now wondering whether to advise this new family which have taken over power. And he has some interesting exchanges with Lady Jessica, in which he, he says, look, Arrakis could be an Eden if its rulers would look up from grubbing for spice. Now, I'm going to the spice question right now. But there's this sense which this desert planet could become an Eden. But how is that possible? And again, that's a part of the book's plot, is this transform potential transformation of the desert planet. And he explains, newcomers like you frequently underestimate the importance of water. You're dealing, you see, with the law of the minimum. And Jessica replies, she thinks, well, he's testing me here. He's asking me, do I know what the law of the 